I couldn't grow a beard to save my life, let alone any bloody chest there. What are you talking about? <laughs> Other than now you're in America, maybe that's where you're hiding your beaver. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Pete Techman Coman, and welcome to another super exciting episode of the Tech Effect. And why is this episode more exciting than the last episode? Well, I will let my good friend, my co host, Mr. Mark the Bearded Tech, tell us why. G'day, Pete. G'day, Mark. <laughs> How are you, mate? How's, How life, you, mate? In, how's life in NYC? NYC, it's coming to life. It's it's yeah. it's spring. Spring has sprung. We we are enjoying warmer weather. Um, I have just signed up. I'm playing softball in Central Park on the weekends, and life is great. You do have a pretty good life, don't you? Hey, I follow you on Facebook on the weekends, and <laughs> life ain't all that bad over there. Just got to make the most of it, right? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Why not? Why not? It's like a, that ain't living Barry sort of BCF. You should you should do the BCF ads in <laughs> BCF in New York. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't understand it over here if they if they played a BCF commercial. <laughs> they have no idea what's going this on. This is living Barry. Good to exactly. go. Exactly. Hey Pete, exactly. we have got an exciting show, um, and uh, I'm very very proud to uh, introduce a fellow we both know have both known for for quite a long time. Uh, he's a industry legend been around for you know i don't know since noah had the ark um <laughs> he doesn't show it though he still looks no, 40 something ageless ageless, ageless. yeah yeah a aging gracefully yeah. <laughs> mr uh, the man himself michael broadbent managing director of midwich australia and apac if i'm if i'm right michael how are you mate well after that what can i say what can i say legend Probably not much. Ageless, <laughs> ageless. So I have been around for thirty years in this industry, believe it or not. Um, you wouldn't so yeah, know. It's been it's been a crazy ride. Yeah, you must have started when you were about ten. Then, by the sound of it, we sort of worked <laughs> uh, out. That. I was actually eleven at the time. Ele yeah, eleven yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to <-y> something. <laughs> you, you may uh, push sixty like these I'm... days. Push and sixty. <laughs> I mean, I, I am so honoured that we have Michael on the show. I even got dressed up a little bit today, right? I have got the, the college shirt on rather than the uh, Tech Man t-shirt. So, yeah. you know, because it, it's a very important episode. I know so you've even got some, that, some, um, some hair coming out your chest, off your, <laughs> on your chest there, Pete. It's going... <laughs> <laughs> that's, why I, that's why I do my button up to here, right? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> <laughs> if I, under I, could, I couldn't grow a beard to save my life, let alone any bloody chest there. What are you talking about? <laughs> Other than now you're in America, maybe that's where you're hiding your beaver. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, that's a great start to the show. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. All right. Well, look, Michael, we've got you on because... Um, we want to just have a chat about uh, a, a lot of things. We'll probably go to all places that we don't even know or haven't discussed. But anyway, we'll we'll, we'll go. We want to talk about like like the state of the industry, you know how Midwich um, has has sort of repositioned or or ha how they've sort of dealt with I suppose COVID in the last twelve months. Um, live events, uh, distribution agreements. Like you guys have had so much going on in the last twelve months. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think the the effect of COVID has actually slowed us down. It certainly has. Um, it certainly has affected our business like everybody else. Um, it's affected our staff, but it hasn't. It hasn't affected our desire to still, you know, to still uh, grow um, and to strengthen our core AV distribution business. Um, for those that aren't aware, Midwich is actually a UK based business. That's what um, I was going to ask you. I mean, like, what what's for those that don't know about Midwich, like wh where did Midwich originate from? How did Midwich, um, you know, sort of land in Australia and, and, and what other parts of the world does Midwich uh, serve? Okay, so Midwich originally started in 89 in the UK um, as a distributor for laptops and printers. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Um, and then 
then around 19, mid 1990s, early late 1990s, started doing more commercial AV. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Stephen Fenby, who's our group MD, joined in 2003, 2004 as our finance manager. And then um, he's ex Deloitte's mergers and acquisitions. So he's a, an MA guy. Um, took over as, as a major shareholder and MD and started acquiring businesses um, in the commercial AV business. Right. So um, the original was in France and in Germany. Uh -huh. And then he met Jerry Wilkins from IDT. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, at a trade show in the, in the UK. I think it was, uh, uh, might have been the US actually. Um, anyway, Jerry, and then become interested in the Australian market. Yep. Uh, obviously, they acquired Jerry's IDT business and become Midwich in 2014. And since then, they've they've acquired um, upwards of 18 or 20 businesses Whoa. and been quite strategic in gaps or both. Is that in, around the world? Or yeah, both in technology, technology and geographical. So yep. we now have a, a, a major presence in UK, Ireland, continental Europe. Um, we acquired a new business in, in uh, UAE early this year called NHK. Yep. So that gives a presence there. We acquired a business in North America last year called Starum. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's still some acquisitions going on. And we opened uh, an office in Singapore uh, last year before last in 2018, yep. 19, sorry. Um, so now we, we do actually have a true a true global presence. Um, most of them still branded as their own, but all part of the Midwich group. Gotcha. And, and so Midwich is a distributor of uh, like some major brands. So what, what, what are some of the brands you guys uh, distribute? With, and does that, and does that change around the world? Like, do you, do you have different agreements say in the UK with certain brands versus Australia and Singapore versus the U S or, or do you do like a global, uh, agreement. So yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> um, is, is probably the, is the answer. Yeah. Um, we we are focused on the commercial AV market, yeah. and we think we're a leading because we're we're focused and that's our core. Mm -hmm. We think we do it better yeah. uh, in terms in terms of branding, in terms of value added services. Um, all the businesses we acquire are typically geographical expansion that are in either commercial video, commercial audio, rental, LED, staging, but all still part of that core AV business. Gotcha. Um, it does change all over the globe. I think we've got, I think we represent around 400 vendors now across the Midwich group, uh -huh. uh, which last year had revenues of about uh, 700 million pound. Wow. So oh. pretty close to 1.4. 1.4 billion Australian yep. um, from our from our from our language, um, but we typically we typically do have similar well-known global brands like Samsung or LG, NEC, Epson across mm -hmm. most of the group. Yep. Um, and since we acquired Starin in North America, uh, we're starting to we've actually developed a group uh, vendor body now or a group body that actually looks at what we can do across the group. And that's things like Zoom. Um, we're doing a hardware as a service offering now for finance. We'll probably talk about more later. Um, my support. Um, and we're trying to do deals like with D10 or with other brands that are actually group-wide, not just geographic. Yeah, well, so where does that, uh, um, where does that put you as far as commercial distrib AV distributors worldwide? You'd have to be up there as, as the biggest, wouldn't you? Um, I think we're the best. Um, I don't think we've ever strived. I don't You're paid to say that, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I, no, seriously, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we've ever strived to be the biggest in revenue because we come up, you know, we, we do come across the, you know, the bigger guys, the Ingrams and those guys, and a lot of a lot of our people that we compete with are in, are in direct competitors because they go direct. Crestron is a classic example. Yeah. Um, so they go direct, but they're not, they're not a direct competitor because of distribution, but they directly compete against our brands. Um, and they you know, I don't know their revenues, but um, I, I think we, we, we strive to be the best in terms of brands, staff, 
and customer experience. We don't always get it right, but that's our stride. We don't, we don't actually measure it by dollars, we're trying to measure it by retention. Yeah, yeah, I'll look, and so that's a great, um, certainly a great attitude to be leading with, that's for sure. I mean, nobody ever gets it right, we're people, but uh, ultimately, but yeah, we're all trying to, trying to strive to, to get better, I hope. Yep. Some aren't. <laughs> some could be, some should be kicked to the curb, but you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, certainly that's, that's not a good Not these days, out. Mark, not these days. <laughs> no. <laughs> Depends on which country you're in, Michael. I mean, like, uh, over it's here, there's, there's no, I, I, I mean, as a, as a business owner in Australia, you, you know, if someone does the wrong thing, you've got to give three warnings, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And it's, mm. yeah, but over here, it's completely different. It's just like, all right, see you later kind of thing. So uh, it, it's, is it, it's is it that easy, Pete? Contrast. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's it's, yeah, it's yeah. certainly, uh, weighted in the in the in the employer section isn't it and, and that may that may vary from state to state but that's what that's what it's like here in in new york yeah right. but you're still there so you must be doing people, something right people are critical and as people that know me know my my philosophy is that people buy from people companies don't buy from companies so the yeah. people the people factor is very critical yeah but sometimes totally where it goes wrong it's not necessarily the people it's the train they've had yeah. It's the environment they're working in. It's the brands they've had. So there's, there's a there's a lot of different things to get that balance. Yeah, people people uh, want to work with people they like and people they trust. And if yeah, you can, I think if you can develop that relationship, then the sales just flow from there. Like if that's your job to sell, but you, you've got to have that relationship. You can't be knocking on doors and expecting people just to buy because because. Uh, you know, you, you have a certain product that you want to sell. I mean, what, what's the value add that you have there? I mean, how, how do you support that customer? Yeah. You know, are you available? I mean, is that support from pricing point of view or availability or whatever it may be, but it, it's developing that relationship and that trust, which is very important. Yeah. So I don't know how far you want to take this, but I, I personally use a, a process called the balance scorecard. And it actually yeah. turns that whole shareholder value thing upside down. Yeah. Rather than let's let's deliver for the shareholders to give them value returns, dividends, make profit, da da da, it actually turns upside down. And says okay, if you have the right people capital, the right working capital, the right processes, the right go to market, you will get sales, you will get strength in the market, you will get profitability, and that will take care of the shareholders. Take care of itself. Yeah, yeah and that's the balance scorecard. So. so before you, you mentioned uh, some of the brands that you deal with, one of them was <clears throat> D10. Now, obviously, um, do you do you distribute D10 in Australia, or is that uh, in other regions? We do, but it's it's yeah. a global deal. A global deal, but it's a global deal. Right. My point is is that um, for those that don't know, D10 is a, a all in one. I mean, think of. Think of Microsoft Surface, um, Surface Hubs. Think of um, Cisco WebEx boards. It's like the equivalent to that in for Zoom, right? It's a Zoom display. It's got a built-in camera, speaker, microphone. It's an all-in-one device. Um, and I saw it a couple of years ago. I, th uh, I think it was Infocom, or uh, and and it looked great. Like it was, it was really really cool. Great idea, great concept. With what's happened in the last twelve months, how has how has it changed your business in Australia? Like, are, are you seeing more, UC, more UCC devices being sold compared to maybe sort of more pro AV video, uh, AV components? Like, what, what has it shifted just because of what's happened? Ooh, we only got 50 minutes, haven't we? Um, <laughs> yes, it has. Um, keeping in mind too that we acquired a business called Vantage in Australia yeah. February last year, so a month before COVID really hit its straps. Mm -hmm. um, because we did say there is a global, we had a global strategy around UC because we do we do see UC as yeah. part of the commercial AV business, mm -hmm. whether it's a huddle room, whether it's a boardroom, whether it's a D10 ME desktop. Um, so yeah, UC is certainly part of our business. It, the hardware side has become a more important part of our business in the last 12 months, accelerated because of COVID, no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you see the numbers coming out of Zoom in terms of licensing, not necessarily paid for, but certainly licensing. 
Um, yeah. You look at what you look at the acceleration of teams. Um, you look at you know what what the others are doing, like the hex of this world. Um, so on the on the other side of that is that we obviously acquired Vantage because of some of their services and some of their UC knowledge, and they were delivering um, limited or services to their customer base but couldn't scale because they were competing against all our partners. Right. So we acquired them, and then we wanted to scale and make all their services available to all our partners. That was the intention. Yep. Yeah. But some of their customers, and we talk about Blue Scope or you know KPMG of this world, or any of the big, the big accounting or law legal firms or you know defence, mm -hmm. they were providing concierge and secured services to their boardrooms and to their meeting spaces. Right. That stopped because everyone started yeah. working from home. Yep. So for every action, there was probably a counteraction on the negative. Mm. Um, so there was no need for concierge. There was no. There was no massive events being um, yeah, being being connected. There was no multi people boardrooms connecting to multi people boardrooms doing a you know doing an AGM. So all that yeah. stopped. Um, and obviously, some of the services we have was an intro service, yeah. where you could you could take a Skype de a Skype call and hook up to a Teams call and hook up to a, a Zoom call. Well, now everyone accelerated their transition from a two year plan to a two month plan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes, it's changed a lot. It's changed a lot, but there, yeah, you know, there's been, it's been, it's been a lot of changes very quickly. Yep. Um, and there's been some technology changes, but fundamentally, um, the use of AV I think has actually accelerated, mm -hmm. and I think you, you feel to say it hadn't, yep. um, but it has accelerated, not necessarily for the benefit of us because we don't, we sell commercial. So all that work from home stuff, it yeah. was bought from your Harvey Normans or from JD Hi-Fi or whatever. Yeah, yeah your Logitech um, sort of stuff. That, Amazon yeah, and, and, they're, and they're using, you know, Zoom home licensing and all that sort of, you know, yeah. all that sort of um, equipment. What it has done for us is it certainly made us rethink things like our ability to provide a room solution, which we're very proud of. Everything in this room is, is us, yes. but contactless. So how do I grab my device that I'm that I'm happy with and I know is COVID safe and walk yeah. into a room and get the room going? I don't want to touch the wall panel anymore. Yeah. I don't want to touch the light switch. So that's been that's been certainly something we've seen. Well, that's one of so Pete's that, babies. Touch uh, left. Yeah, I was going to say. Was, <laughs> I mean, one thing that I, I talk about a lot when it, when I'm sort of doing presentations and, and talking to to clients is uh, creating touchless environments and touchless environments. So, um, you know, so when I say touch less and maybe a one touch meeting join, for example, um, so we're trying to, we're trying to reduce the number of touches or, or like you mentioned, Michael, is, is how do I control the space from my personal device that I feel comfortable touching all the time. But I mean, are you, one thing that I, I think that will, um, we'll start to see rolled out as a result of, of what's happened in the last 12 months and for the reasons that you just pointed out is, is voice, voice control. Are you seeing anything or is Midwich doing anything or do you have any products that support that? Or, or are you talking to manufacturers about voice control within, within a space? You got any thoughts on that? Uh, certainly it, it, it was a discussion and it got a little bit trendy for a while. Yeah. Um, we're not seeing a lot of it in the corporate or the education environment. Yeah. I think students use a lot of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of what we're delivering or what some of our partners are delivering, I, I, it's, I think it's there and it's been developed. But I don't, I, you know, we talked, you know, we, we're probably going to talk about AVR of IP, similar yeah. to that. You know, because I think a lot of stuff in the last 12 months has, has been put on hold mm -hmm. um, for various regions, whether it's contactless, whether it's a hybrid, whether it's a work from home, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, but we're not we're not seeing a massive uptake in in what we thought was going to happen yeah. in terms of AV over IP in, in terms of voice control. There's been sort of a bit of a halt. Um, there's been a lot of a lot of work in digital signage because retail went nuts. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk around autonomy with cars, autonomous cars, because you know people are buying cars. people aren't travelling, so they're spending money on property. And we've seen that with property booms and you know guys doing home automation are still doing yeah. quite well. Yeah. Guys are doing home theatre doing quite well. Yeah. But are they using voice activation to do that? 
I think they are maybe through a Google assistant or through a you know some sort of some sort of yeah. client, but we're not seeing it. Okay. If we double back, just double back to um, uh, your Vantage acquisition for a second. So uh, you said that all that sort of corporate support had really dropped off, so, but you've actually developed that on and reacted to that as well, haven't you? Yeah. So we've um, we took the we took the lead from our UK counterparts who developed a thing called my my support, which is obviously midwich support um, and as a value add. So the original one was an extended warranty. So when you buy a, a bright sign, you get 12 months warranty, but it's going to be in place for five years. If the a normal customer says, I want to just plug and play and forget about it. So they buy an ex additional four years. Same with the dexterity, same with the Samsung, whatever. Um, so then we took that with the acquisition of um, our European, with the acquisitions here, with Vantage, with the help desk, and with our Starin acquisition, we've actually now developed a, a midwich or my support help desk, which is true follow the sun, because we have people in America that take over the ticketing system, then to us who take over the ticketing system, but then we hand over at night time from here to the U to the UK. So we actually have a full 24 hour follow the sun help desk. Um, and that now we've actually taken further to that, where we're now developing um, a proactive monitoring product, um, which is vendor agnostic, and which any, which any of our partners can buy and sell per IP address or per IP device. Um, and there's a fair few uh, conversations and proof of concepts going around because people are now more remote. Mm -hmm. So they actually now remote management mm -hmm. is even more critical. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. I think that's certainly come up on our radar a lot more as an integrator where we're doing, okay, how do we do this remotely? Because we don't know if... Um, we, we just don't know if we're going to be able to get across the border. And if yeah. we do, well, we don't know if, know if we're going to be able to get back, like the, the reactions um, that quick. So so what does that my support mean for, for us as integrators? Like can, we can resell that as a program? Yeah, we don't, we don't sell direct. Everything we do is through the channel. Um, so it's, but it's in a price book. So it's on, it's but you're, selling, effectively, you're selling an SLA. Yes, we are. We're backing you up as an SLA, correct, yeah. with, a, with a margin built in for the integrators. So we've done the investment. We've spent the hundreds of thousands of dollars to get it all going and, and the development um, and all the licensing. Um, and then you can, you know, I, I think it's 39 cents or whatever it is uh, per device. Um, you can buy it for 30. Don't yeah. quote me on that, but that sort of, that sort of thing. And then yeah, yeah. we take the SLA. And, you know, the key part is we've called it My Support, which is MI Support which doesn't tie to Midwich. Yeah. It can be anybody's my support. So yeah. effectively you can white, you've white labeled it to some degree that we can- That's exactly what we want people to do. Yeah. But, yeah we're happy to yeah. we'll answer everything my support and do it my support, but you can white label it, you can rebrand it, you can do whatever you like with it. You mentioned that you charge per per device. Is that is that how it works, the price Don't instruction? Don't me, Pete, but I think, that's, I think that's how it is, yes. Okay, but, but I, just out of curiosity, I mean, and, and is it a like a set, uh, a set price per device or does it alter does it vary depending on the type of device like because i'm thinking that some devices are a lot more complex than others and you know might need more yeah. support for some so we're, we're only doing proactive monitoring we're not actually doing the break fix that's still up to the integrator to do that okay all right so we're we're yeah. giving them an option to be proactive yes and to get monthly reports or or alerts and alarms when something is not right Gotcha. So we don't do Crestron, we don't do AMX, we don't do Extron, but yeah. we can monitor an Extron, an AMX or a Crestron device on behalf of the integrator. Something uh, goes wrong, we trigger and tell them and try and do level one triage. And then if they need to, then they do level two, level three, break fix. We yep. can manage some of that, but we don't, that's not what the proactive monitoring device or service is about. Yeah. 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 Um, so it gives us the opportunity as an integrator to potentially uh, bring it to light with the client before the client even knows about it. Yeah, and also the reporting back to the client monthly, which yeah. a lot of a lot of clients like to yeah. see, particularly universities and and corporates of room use. You know, who's who's booking the room and not using it? What technology is yeah. being used? What's technology is effective? So all that sort of stuff is also part of the reporting. So, yeah. so does that require? Um, any any hardware, any additional hardware to do the monitoring, or do you 
require all those devices to be on a network so you can see that remotely? How, how does that kind of... Uh, That's totally work? dependent on the site and on what's going on. Yeah. Typically, if they don't, if the if the SI or the end user doesn't want us on the network, we'll have a little standalone server, which we talk to, and the net talks to their devices. Gotcha. Yeah, whether that's a NOOC, whether it's a service, whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, but that's really dependent on on the IT requirements or the IT security and the protocols of the of the site. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that, that's um, and that's the battle, I guess, isn't it? That's uh, it's certainly in a corporate environment and education for us it's probably not um, most of them and you just go I need a I need a, pa a path out and they'll just go yep we'll just we'll just give you a, a tunnel and off you go sort of thing so uh, yep. but maybe in the corporate it's a bit more a uh, bit more secured yeah it is and, and, and obviously part of our part of our help desk and part of our services is that the old advantage because they're doing work for government defense is IRAP certified so we do actually have that that full security certification as well which is another which is another value-added service that the typical SI or the typical reseller can't do or doesn't have. Yeah, but, but can but can sell that and bundle it in as their own top scenario. Yeah, think of it. Think of it as a as a panel as another product. Um, some people like Samsung and LG come to us. Some don't, so they don't come to us. So we yeah, just, yeah. It's just it's a, it's a service we're offering, um, yeah. and we've tried to productize it so that the channel can resell it. But, but I, uh, I don't think they're, I think in the past, we, we companies or organizations haven't uh, invested um, or put enough time and effort into working out how to put these kinds of devices onto their network. I think they've taken the easy option and gone, oh, just, just segregate it, right? And they've, they've had a separate network, like an air gap network for AV and, and for their IT stuff. We're just wrapping up a project here in New York where it is a totally converged network. Every every device that requires a IP connection is on the client's network. They supply all the switches. It's on the same cabling uh, infrastructure. It 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 can be done, right? And this is a bank, so it is. You know, like if it'd probably be the last. Uh, vertical that you would try to to create a converged network uh, on or with being a financial institution. So that's what I'm saying. It, I believe it is a myth. I think there are a lot of um, manufacturers, AV manufacturers that need to uh, need to improve their product in the sense uh, so it, it can be more readily allowed on a network from a security point of view. I think there are many large companies out there that have old operating systems that are not supported anymore, right? Um, you know, and 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 quite often that information is not publicised at all. You're like you, it's it's hard to actually find out what is that operating system that's running on that display or that touch panel or, or whatever it may be. Um, but it can be done. It, it can, yeah, be, can done. be. Yeah, um, I'm just surprised uh, that not more companies have have done that because you think about it people people think all right well we'll have all these air gaps on the network we'll have all these separate networks for all these devices um but that actually in my opinion is riskier because you, they still need some form of internet connection so they still somehow connect to the client's network at some point and, it, and, and those networks are typically less secure if you put everything on the client's network that is totally secure. It's everything's monitored. Um, you know, they can basically they can see what's going on uh, with every device. And sometimes there are rogue devices, and we find out pretty quickly about that, and you know, get them off the network. But yeah, it's just it's just interesting. I, I as I said, hopefully, like with this project that we're doing, it's a you know, we we can prove to others that it is actually possible. And I think I think that does happen here as well. Yeah. Um, not so sure about south, other parts of Southeast Asia because yeah. there's not you know, some of the standards and protocols are different to here. Yeah. I, I, most of our vendors these days, when we ask the question about security or, or IT management, have the checklist in place and have the protocols in place to put any concerns at risk uh, away. The problem I see is that the IT fraternity still it's a risk management issue more yeah. than a hardware 
or a network issue. Um, their challenge is, is to is to be conservative in their risk management. Um, and we see, you know, we, we see and hear all the time about the GDPR in the in the UK, the the, the rights protection. Um, yeah. And if you get caught, or if you if you uh, cause a, a, a break, or a you know, if, if you're part of the problem where there's a hack, mm. the fines personally and from a company point of view are massive. Yeah. So I think half the issue, or some of the issue, is also risk management management and risk mitigation, as opposed to the hardware can't do it. But, but I, think, I think there's also a part of this, so Pete, is, is that um, there, you know, that, that the product, the vendor might make the product that's certainly um, well IP enabled and secure and everything else. There's a skill, there's a skill shortage, come in the AV world as well of of the ability to communicate properly to the IT departments to put them at ease, say it is, to how to how to say it is safe, and potentially there's also a documentation shortage from the vendor as well. I mean, they might have all the great support, but if they're not documenting the IT part of that in their, in their manuals or there's, a, there's an IT white paper or something like that, yeah, it's, it falls down there as well. Sure, but that, that's, I see that as being our role as consultants where we are the ones that are finding that information out up front and so what products are better? I mean, we've, yeah, we've, we've found out on this project, we, you know, some products we've put on the network and they've just done some really, really weird, funky things that just don't fly in IT world, right? But you soon find those things out. So, but what happens is that I agree that there is, I think, a skill shortage in the AV industry as far as IT knowledge goes. But the thing is, is that the kind of knowledge that, they may require, um, they're never really exposed to it because those secrets are with the client. How that network is structured is with the client, That the network architecture. Um, so, but once again, that's where we get involved and we help design that network infrastructure and architecture and, and select the products that are gonna work best for that, that client's needs. But you're right, I mean, we, we have to do a lot of digging. I mean, I, I contacted, you know, extra on the other week about an operating system that they have on their touch panels. And, and, uh, you know, I got to, you know, know a couple of people there. And he said, that's the first time anyone's ever asked me that. Right. He said, we don't document it. We, we don't do it. We have no reason to document it. Uh, we don't want people to know what it is from, from a security point of view, but it is difficult. It is difficult. And, and sometimes it's through trial and error that you find that information out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what I've, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> I okay. You've lost your train of thought. I want to never short words, shift please. gears a little bit, here, right? So I know where I was going. <laughs> it's come back what, to me now. But you start talking because you don't. You don't ever stop. So let, let's go. Exactly. There. Exactly. Let's go what, there. What are, Michael, what, what's your thoughts uh, on uh, in-person events? So. Um, in Australia, we, we've got Integrate. Uh, Europe has got ISC. Uh, in the US, it's got Infocom. Um, you know, we've seen all these shows cancelled over the last 12, 15 months. I think the last show that we had was was uh, ISC in Amsterdam in last year. Yeah. yeah. And well, even 20, that, I mean, yeah. Like, yeah, 20. like LG pulled out, a number of companies pulled out because they didn't think it, w it was safe and, and whatever. Um, what's the future of these shows in, in your opinion? Like, are they going to survive? Will they come back to normal? Will we see different formats? What's, and, and also what's Midwich's approach uh, to all this? So the, so the current corporate take is that while the pandemic is still declared a pandemic and the vaccine is not widely distributed yet, um, our current corporate policy, if you like, is that we won't put our people at risk by having them attend trade shows or any show or any sort of uh, event where we don't control or we can't control the COVID protocols or their safety. Right. So that has meant that we we won't attend IC. We haven't done Infocom. Um, we pulled out of IC last year, the last minute. We actually oh, right. had two people on the plane heading over mm, when, wow. when we finally pulled the pin. We've got that close. Yep. 
Um, and that was a major investment for us. Yeah. Um, not just here, but certainly in the UK and, and in mm. Europe. Um, and that's purely just to make sure that we keep our people safe. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, if, if something changes or someone can prove otherwise, um, then we will review it. And currently we, are, we have a, a mandate to review it on the 1st of October, right. which unfortunately means that Integrate does fall into that and we won't be, we won't be attending Integrate. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean, though, we won't be supporting industry. And one of the things I think as, a, as one of the leading players or people or companies in the AV industry, we need to support the industry. So we still will maintain our sponsorships. We still will maintain our connections. We will still do everything we can to help and assist the industry to prosper. We physically just can't do it because of the current situation. So, so what does that look like from a midwitch point of view? I mean, are, are you going to, uh, because the position that you're in and, and you, uh, your organisation uh, distributes and supports many, many products, are you going to host your own events? And yeah, so we do that anyway. We do that anyway because each of our offices, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Singapore, New Zealand, um, you know, we, can, we have showroom facilities and we can demonstrate most of our products. We do training courses both online and now in situ with, with COVID policies being, re being released a bit, yep. um, depending on the situation, depending on the protocol, the COVID protocol. Um, what we are, we, we will be doing our own partner summit again this year, um, which I think both of you have attended in the past, um, which is a, you know, it's an invitation only, but we're going to open it up a little bit. Uh, it'll probably be towards the end of the year. We haven't confirmed the dates yet, probably October, November, and it'll probably be in New South Wales somewhere. Um, New South Wales have been the most responsive and the most economically, or most focused on the economy and balance of COVID. In terms of not closing borders and outbreaks and trying to manage what they can, so we'll probably have it in in New, in New South Wales, and but it's something we can control. We can do the pro, the COVID protocols. We'll probably have to limit it to a certain amount of people, and then on the back of that, we, instead of doing one day, which we normally do, we'll probably do a second day, and on the second day, we'll have a, a mini trade show. Okay, so because the vendors the past, can come and sorry. In the past, the, the, those summits, uh, they haven't been, you, you haven't had product on display. Like it wasn't like a mini integrator. And the first half won't be still. The first half yeah. is about the customer and about okay. the market and about yeah. some of the things changing. Economic report will still be there. Um, you know, how we see the future will be there. The panel discussion on the things that affect our industry will still yeah. be there. Stage two will be added, which is what we haven't done in the past, and have a small mini trade show on site with our major vendors or all our vendors that can, that can participate. I, I must say, I really enjoyed that format that, that you've, you've put out over the last couple of years um, because it wasn't all about technology or it wasn't all about AV. You know, you would have someone come in from a bank, for example, and talk about the economy and, and then you'd have mm. a, you know, like a guest speaker. I remember in, in Melbourne, you had Kevin Sheedy up there. He was amazing. Like he about was coaching, just, about coaching yeah, people. Was, that's that's mm. right. You know, Write this down, right? Remember yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, we've had um, we've had we had um, you know an accountant who's really about buying and selling businesses and how he how he views businesses. Um, yeah, it, it, the whole idea of it is about the industry and about it's not about speeds and feeds. Yeah, and you actually notice there was it's very brand agnostic too. It's not yeah. sponsored by saying. Although we did introduce Phil Bort when he first turned up to Australia, we gave him five minutes. Yeah. Um, but it's, that's not what it's, it's about. The industry. Yeah. 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 Sp speaking of speaking of the industry, um, the uh, one of the forums was uh, certainly about. Uh, well, it ended up being very focused on the skills shortage into. Um, in the AV industry, what's your actually what? And, and even Pete, question for you: What do you see as is is that still a very real challenge? I mean, for us, hiring right now, I'm pretty lucky. I've got some good key people, um, and and they're they're quite well skilled. But oh, geez, I've had a I've had a fair challenge in years gone by trying to good, find good skill. So yes, it is. It is a challenge. Um, I don't think it's so much of a challenge went quite probably in COVID times because, you know, there has been some redundancies. There has been some, some jobs lost. There has been some downtime. Um, 
if you look at the market well, there's a hell of, figures. There's a lot of roadies and, and, and that sort of stuff that, you know, events, live events, and they, they were yeah, up they, for grabs. So, you know. for a job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, you know, one of our new people is actually from that industry. Um, but the, the, the reality is it's still there in the background. It hasn't gone away. You know, the market might have dipped 20% last year in, in real terms of sellout dollars. Um, they're forecasting it might actually come back up at 29%. Wow. So we're back to, we're still that's, got- That's growth. the AV market. That's the, that's the commercial AV market. Yeah. Wow. Particularly, particularly around display. Um, and that's based on future source. We haven't seen the, the first quarter numbers yet, but that was based on 220 numbers. Um, the 221 future source first quarter numbers are due out end of this month. Um, but, but it'll be interesting to see. But that doesn't that means that the, the problem hasn't gone away. We still have a, a shortage. And for those who have known me for a while, know I, this is one of my pet subjects. Mm. Um, even when I was back in the day working with KLM and with the program team, we actually employed some AV apprentices because Brisbane TAFE did an entertainment and technology second and third year um, focus of part of the electrical trade. No one else has done it, and Avixa certainly, they do their CTS and they do bits and pieces, but, you know, they're on the right track with, with, Benny, with, uh, with Benny Caswell doing the, the, yeah. the, the tech team out of schools, you know, that, that, that um, early entry, you know, ground root stuff. Um, we need to do more of it. We need to, as a group, we still need to lobby and get that going. Well, yeah, no, certainly I... going to see the, uh, I mean, if we're going to go to 29%, uh, we're all we're going to see is the, is the issue amplified, really, aren't we? Yep, yep. I, I, and I know Mark and I have spoken about this before, and, and um, I I also, I agree that with what Benny was doing and, and bringing those, those young people through was, was great, <clears throat> but it, it needs to be broader than just that. It needs to be broader than just, you know, sort of, um, like theatre lighting and audio and, and stuff like it, it needs to be also the hands on stuff like it, rather than just the operation side of things. I said, not saying that that's not important, but how can we broaden that? And, and I, I was going to say um, the biggest problem, is there is no real pathway for these young people coming through. Um, you know, I mean, you mentioned, Michael, that, you know, Brisbane TAFE had had some form of pathway or some form of training for apprentices. But uh, I mean, it, it's such a great industry. It's such a great opportunity for young people to get in, in there, learn some skills and earn decent money because there is a shortage uh, of these people. So, yeah. you know, prove your worth and you, 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 uh, your pay goes up. But it's like somebody's got to do something, really. I mean, like it, it's like to, to really forward, have formal training that, that can get people into our industry. Well, we actually out of that out of that forum we had, we actually come up with I think I think it was about thirty roles across seven or eight of the large integrator set. Yeah, we'll take four, we'll take ten, we'll take six as an outcome. Um, but we we couldn't get the the TAFE colleges or the yeah because they were to actually run the course. They yeah. wanted they wanted a hundred students over three states. Um, so there is that there is that desire there. I think there is a there is certainly um, the appetite. Uh, there certainly is. I think the industry will do it, but it just probably needs someone. Uh, and it, we, I think we're all hoping a VIXA would do that, if we could say that. But I, I don't think they are the right body. They're, they're obviously a, a large global association. Um, it's probably us, up to us here or a, a body here to actually drive that. But do I mean, the other part is, that do, we, do we actually have the trainers that, that could train it, that could... Teach it. I think I think we could. Yeah, I think we could. I, I think so. it's really just the buy-in from the industry to to actually invest in it. Like so you probably kind of take the TTS like stuff Nika. and the the Vixa stuff, and then um, and then and run it through TAFE. It'd, it'd be a whole lot better than well, the one that I actually seen the curriculum that Brisbane had, and it's quite good. So it's it's the electrical concepts in year one, and then year two and three is just on amplifiers and speakers and audio and display and resolution and, and you know it's all it's all about entertainment technology as they put it yeah. but it was all fun and then and young brad who was with us back then who's now actually the head of leading of technology with them um he actually comes through the whole system and was doing practical four days a week on the tools perfect yeah yeah for yeah. sure yeah that's right 
Well, and even even a even a, a cert a cert four course or, or a uni course, you know, where, where people can do can study the the academia side of it or the the you know the the, the theory side. Yeah. Um, and instead of coming out as an engineer, they can come out as a technician. Yeah. 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 So yes, there is a there is a shortage, and it will get worse. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, it's not. Yeah, we've got to do something basically now, haven't we, to stand up and be counted. Exactly. Mm. So what, uh, Michael, I mean, have you got any new products that you can talk about that uh, you're bringing on board or um, some new technology that maybe some of the, some of the uh, manufacturers that you deal with are, are bringing out that you, that excite you moving forward? Yeah. So yeah, probably um, there's always something going on. There's always new brands coming on. There's always changes. Yeah. Um, there's some interesting changes in, in, uh, remote back to the office transition that I'm, I'm keen to watch how that unfolds over the next six to nine to 12 months. Um, so I think we'll see some, some also some things we weren't expecting in terms of people's behaviour and how they adopt, particularly the hybrid. Where yep. you're gonna, where at the moment there's the three of us and we're all equal, we're all equally cropped, with, you know, right? But, but when I come back to the office, I'm gonna have seven people in the office around a table exactly. and I'm still get home, what's going to happen? What's the, exactly. what's the, so I, I'm interested to see how that happens, but we don't have technology to answer that yet, but we are, you know, we, we, we're thinking about open offices more because yep. the 1.5, instead of having hundred people on a floor plate, you yep. might have 50. So you won't have that noise pollution. Yep. You won't, you know, people wear a headset. So how do we inject pink noise or how do we yep. create that noise pollution to still create privacy or still create, isolation in conversation. So that's interesting. Um, and the other thing we're seeing is even though AV over IP, and we talked about networks before, hasn't really taken off and there's still a lot of HD based T around, things like NDI and the development of technology like NDI um, are quite interesting. I, I just I want to go back to that point you made about um, transitioning back to the office. Uh, I I recently did a presentation and um, copped a bit of stick about a, a concept that I came up with because what I was saying was that when people, I believe that uh, when people go back to the office, we are so used to like we are now, it, it, it's sitting or standing in front of our, our computers uh, we, and we're framed, our heads are framed. And so there's more people, everyone's framed. We're not in the same room like we used to be where, and the camera was viewing the whole room. So will we, when we come back to the office, will there be an expectation or ha have, has our behavior changed in such a way where we're not gonna use a meeting space to jump on a call. We're just gonna sit, out, sit at our desk and take the call. So. I'm really interested in from a from a, a sort of a, a learnt behaviour point of view. How does the workplace now change? Are we going to have less meeting spaces as a result? But wh where I got a little bit ridiculed was I came up with this idea or concept of okay, like exactly what you just said before, right? We can control the digital audio. We can wear headphones. We can have a microphone. What we can't control is the analog audio, our voices mm. within an open plan workspace. And, and, the, and the concept was this um, uh, acoustic air curtain. So it wasn't, it didn't have any visual impacts, but it was able to actually between um, each desk in an open workplace have this uh, acoustic air curtain. So people can have conversations like we're having now and not disturb the people around them. And then, there was all these comments in the chat, you know, it was like uh, the cone of silence and blah, blah, blah. And, and like, <laughs> I'm like, you just, but, just picture this. <laughs> it comes down when you want to have a, a private phone call. But, oh, chief. But, but surely, <laughs> surely, you know, like there is technology or someone out there that can create something like this to allow us work in this new way. Yeah, I, I, it, it'll be interesting to. It needs to. It will. I think that needs to be looked at because it, it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. Look, I, Pete, I think there'll be an expectation for you to start wearing pants. That'll be a good start. Um, <laughs> but, but also, I think there'll be. <laughs> There'll also be, there's a lot more, like there's, there's a company um, just uptown here and they're really focused, they're, they're an acoustics company, right? So yeah. 
Um, yeah, they're, they're focused around uh, phone booths, effectively, and things like that. I think you know, they'll, they'll certainly come to light. I mean, they're, they're already coming to light into, into co-working spaces. Um, yeah. You know, randomly, there's a co-working space down the road, and they have these phone booths, privacy booths, and you can hear, you go into one and you can hear the person on the call the next, oh, next door even yeah. even better. <laughs> but uh, they haven't quite executed that well. But I th there's certainly the acoustic companies that will, will have those roll in. But, bang. but I, I know just from our, my experience here, like I've been coming in every day, I've, I'm on, on this call in my office and then, um, you know, the, the, the owner of the business sits in the office next to me. Now, Go back 18 months ago, if we were getting on a call together, we would go to the boardroom and we'd sit in the boardroom together and we'd be on that call. We don't do that anymore. We're sitting in adjacent offices on the same call in front of our computers talking yeah. to people because that's just that learnt behavior because yeah. of what's happened. It's and we, we had an all staff meeting yesterday, just to quick up, uh, we have a monthly catch up, yeah. um, which was born out of COVID actually. Yep. We, we started trying to, you know, communicate faster, better and more broadly and more 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 um, relaxed about just open conversation. But even yesterday we had our team in, in Blonde Robot in Melbourne, probably a half a dozen in their, in their meeting space. And I think everybody else, uh, maybe myself and David, were at their desktop. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, and well. we, we had a client that came back earlier than most in, in, in New York and uh, everyone had been working remotely and there were three people going into the office regularly and they would get on, they would go into the boardroom and, and be on this call. And the first time that happened, the first day that they did that, the comments were from the people at the far end, but you're so far away. And we had an auto framing camera. Like they, it, it wasn't as if the, the camera was zoomed out or anything. It was zoomed in on the three people in the room, but the, the feedback was, you're too far away because you were so used to having everyone's head framed individually on the screen. Well, it's interesting because um, <clears throat> I think the etiquette is different at your desktop than it is in a meeting room. Mm -hmm. So I'll still mention something to David, but I didn't yeah. mute my microphone. Now, if I was there, I would be on mute normally. Um, and you're right, the distance was an issue. There was, there was probably two people in that room I couldn't tell in the Melbourne board who was in that because I was yep. at the back of the room. Yep. Um, and the other thing I noticed is that when when I had all, everybody up on the screen, anybody that was at the desktop and framed similar to what we're framed, if they went, if they did, they'll, I could see they wanted to say something. So I'd yes. stop and say, yeah. you want to say something, Peter? Yeah. I couldn't see that in a meeting space. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I think, I don't know what it really means, but yeah. the dynamic will certainly change and we need to be mm -hmm. aware of it. Yeah. Yeah, yep. could have wondered if those auto framing cameras could could give you a uh, separate feed for each for each head. <laughs> well, there was up. there was trials for it. I remember the three hundred and sixty camera and the the huddle. Uh, what was the one with was a triangular? So they've tried different ways to do it. Hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, Polycom I think came out with the technology, didn't they? Or, or Microsoft, one of the two, and they had that three hundred and sixty degree camera hmm. on the desk and to try and make everyone. Oh, spinner, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but never really kind of took off, which is which is a little. Maybe it will now. Yeah. Speaking of uh, speaking of Polycom, that's a great segue, Pete. I'm glad you glad you said that. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Mark. Let's let's think about the QR code. Oh, QR. Has no, anyone I mean, seen it, my? It, it'll never take off. It was dead, and then it come alive. So I, maybe uh, the 360 camera will. You look. <laughs> hold hold that thought. Oh, I can't. I can't find it. My my Here's business card. Earlier. My business card. Right. Is a QR code. On one on one side, it's got "G'day, I'm Mark." <laughs> just in case for the, and it's really big because I want to make sure I'm known. And then on the other side, it's just got a QR code. That's it, right? I got smashed for it, absolutely smashed. And I mean, the IT guys are going, "This is fantastic." Scan, bang, and your all my details just scan straight in your phone. Um, but you know, you give it to a builder or a project manager on site, and they're going. What the hell is this thing? Oh, don't give me that because they're probably still on their Nokia 3210. However, um, uh, now if, even my project manager said to me, he said your business cards have, have they've come back with a vengeance. Like you know, everyone knows what a QR code is now, yeah. and everyone's got to use it. I'm still seeing people play ignorance when walking into a into a venue, going, 
what's this? What, you mean I've got a scan? Mate, you're sitting there going, mate, you've been gutted. Have, have you been living under a rock for the last 12 months? You've got a scan to go into anywhere. But, you know, bang scan, they go, oh, oh, great, cool, bang, done. Like, QR codes are definitely back but with have, have, have I didn't mean to digress, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> have, have you seen the new business cards that are actually like a, they're a, a metal card, like a credit card, and they've got all that information on it, and then you just tap it on their yeah. phone, and the same thing, it transfers the information. It's bringing back the old, remember the old bump app? You know, you, you just bumped your two phones together and transferred your details. It's like next level. <laughs> anyway, we've digressed from the original segue. The segue was um, Polly. <laughs> Polly. So, um, Hardware so a service. It's a bundle. It's a bundle of a service, with including the hardware. Uh, it's a finance package. Think of a printer. No one yeah. buys a printer. People buy it per page from a Rico or from a Ethan or whoever. So we're trying to package bundles into hardware as a service, and we want to then, because it's going to be a three- or five-year term of finance, we're trying to also package in the extended warranty and the help desk or whatever else you might need in that five years. Um, the reason we're doing it is because we believe after COVID, we've got a massive debt to pay back. The economy won't be as strong as everyone thinks. Um, we think working, working capital and capital expenditure by the university, by the education, by the government, by the via the corporate market will be finite, it will be limited. Hmm. So we're introducing another way, which is an OPEX. So it's really nothing new. It's just packaged. It's a package bundle. So instead of having to buy a screen, a camera, a microphone, and a whatever, you buy it including the service wrap or including the support and the extended warranties. So if you're going to enter, enter a deal for $40 a month for the next five years, you know it's actually covered for the next five years. And do you so own it? Does the client own it at the end of that period or is it, you know, do they, is it just kind of like a, almost like a rental? Because I know like we've tested It is a rental. It's, it's a rental, Pete. So they yeah. can buy it at the end for a dollar. Right. But no, the asset is owned by the by the finance company or by the integrator or by us, depending who does the deal or how, how the deal's done. Yeah, and I, it's that's how Tesla does their financing. I mean, you could uh, you could get a loan for the whole amount, or they have this lease option, but you don't own it at the end of that lease. So I think it's a thirty six month lease, and um, you're basically just renting the vehicle over that over that period. Yeah. Again, again, it's just a, a productization, if you like. Yeah. yeah we we put a bundle together. You can buy that bundle if you want outright. Yeah. But if you also want to, if you want to, if you don't have the capex, you can then have the option to take it over a three or five year rental term. And then, look, we're at the end of JobKeeper now, and and um, it'll be interesting to see how the next three months, next ninety days, sort of really play out, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, that Pete, I don't know, don't know if you're aware that finished on uh, March thirtieth. Um, okay. First, no more handouts. Yeah. No more handouts. Yeah, anyone yes. who's uh, was, you know, has got to stand on their own two feet. Which you know, which will be interesting to see because uh, look, I, I heard someone recently selling uh, it was actually a builder. It wasn't in the AV industry, but they, we we learn a lot from every from every other industries. But they were selling a job um, with free labour, right? They weren't charging labour on these jobs, so they, of course, they got so much work. Yeah, because because they were you know thirty percent cheaper than everybody else. They got heaps and heaps of work, and now now I'm sitting there going, well now you got to pay people, and they're just using JobKeeper as the way to pay the uh, staff. Yeah. Um, and now I'm going, okay, well you've screwed the market number one, yeah, yeah. Uh, and number two now you've probably screwed yourself because you've backed all this work up, and now you've actually yeah, got to yeah. pay for it. So you actually pay people for it. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll certainly be interesting to, to see, and we'll, wow. and we'll see some um, even in the AV industry. Hopefully we don't like You know, I don't ever wish um, going broke and all that and get that sort of stress on anybody. I, I just don't think that's that's great for. Well, there's, there's certainly health. there's certainly a few that won't come back. Yeah, yeah, it's sad you know. to see, but yeah, well, even by their own own decision, you know, I know a couple of have bought a hotel and just doing a a, a motor in. Um, a couple have taken on lawn mowing franchises, far it's less stressful, and yeah, just just out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there were some, some, um, you know, uh, some certainly pocketed a whole lot of money uh, in the job keeper, and then just went, 
guilt free at here. the end of <laughs> at the end of March, yeah. gone. All right, that's it. We've got some money. We're going into something else, and and uh, and guilt free, and and sort of sitting on there, going. Well, we're good. But thankfully, we are like starting COVID. to see a bit more positivity in the market now. Yep. We're certainly seeing, it from our point of view, in terms of pipeline and projects coming back online, inquiry rate. You know, a fair few green shoots are starting yep. to are starting to appear now, which is which is good to see. Yeah, I think there's still opportunity for for people to um to improve the ones that are the ones that have sort of. Uh, invested a lot in their marketing and and through that COVID time uh, have seemed to be sprouting pretty well now. That um, so yeah, and your niche and, and you go know, at the end of when all's said and done, we're still here, sort of thing. So yeah. interesting to see how that plays out. You agree with that, Michael? You got a funny you got a funny look on your face. <laughs> no, no, I, I do agree with it. I, I, I just with the amount of uncertainty we've had for the last 12, 15 months. Um, there's still you know, it's still a balancing act. It's still a bit uncertain. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's yeah. looking better. Yep, yep, yep. Well, look, I think uh, we we might wrap this up, Pete. Uh, it's been awesome to have you on on uh, on the Tech Effect, Michael. Uh, interesting I, conversation. It wasn't where I thought we were going, but it was interesting. Oh, look, you know, we <laughs> never know really we don't know where, where, it's where going. we're going with these <laughs> conversations. Like, how are you going to know where we're going? <laughs> Look, uh, I, I stand. I think Michael would agree with me. Uh, it's been great to have you on because you know uh, you're not only you're not living in you know in MD world right up there with the fairies. Uh, you're always uh, you, you can always get hold of you and have a chat with you. You've come through the ranks of you've, the world of integrator, and you know what what it's like on the ground. So you've also you've got a, a very humble uh, approach to. You know certainly how our industry operates so certainly thank but, you but also is it very much you know and i'm not you know a term that they don't know over here is pissing in your pocket but um it's away pete <laughs> it's away <laughs> no but I, I i i've always admired your out of the box thinking i mean we've had we've had many conversations about different aspects of the industry and opportunities and and things like that and I think that's what it takes. You you have to, you can't, businesses who just sit back, uh, you know, sit on their hands and think that everything's going to be fine. You, you can't, you've got to keep reinventing yourself all the time. You've got to be agile. You've got to look for improvements all the time and think outside the box. And and you've, I, I believe you've always done that, whether it's in, in the way that you conduct business, the products that you, you sell, uh, the events that you put on, all those kinds of things, like the markets that you want to get into. Obviously, you, you got into Singapore and all that kind of stuff. And it's so refreshing because I think complacency is the biggest killer. I, I've, I've, I've been in the industry for a while and I've seen companies get complacent and it, they, it just, they just go downhill. You can't get complacent. You've got to always be yeah. reinventing yourself. If you're, not, if you're not improving, you must be going backwards. You're going backwards. It's always been a bit of a philosophy. Yep. 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 Yeah, you're always yep. going forward or you're going backwards. One of the and we, we, all, we, all want to, we, all, we all need to find what gets us out of bed every morning. Yep. And it's, not, it's not profit. It's not salary. That's the mm. short-term thing. It's really about what you can do for the industry and what you get back out of the industry, the, the, the self-fulfillment, yep. which I've really enjoyed this industry. Uh, for 30 yeah. years. So. Yeah, nice I one. I appreciate, I appreciate the, the comments. Thank you, James. Yeah, nice one. Nice one. All right, look, thanks again, Michael. And uh, uh, we're going to say goodbye on the Tech Effect. You can see us on YouTube, LinkedIn for the Kiwis. Uh, you can. Where else can you see us? On uh, Facebook and oh, we're in your face everywhere. But you can also <laughs> hear us if you want Here's to. Podcasts. Podcast. If you can't watch us or you, you can't stand to watch us, which is understandable, you can listen to us. You could yeah. be driving, you could be jogging, yeah. you could be on the train, yeah. wherever. You're going to infiltrate your life whether you like it or not. So uh, j jump on, give us a like, give us a shout out, uh, and, um, and we look forward to seeing you all guys uh, very soon. Thanks again, Pete. No worries. Thanks, Mark. And big thank you once again to Michael. For sure. See you guys. Take care. Yeah, bye.